Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're live from our homes, uh, kids and pets included. Yes, we're not the only one. Uh, my name is Said Lama. I'm the industry account manager at Solicat for the civil market. And today with me is Matt Colbert and Colin Godet. We're technical consult consultants for the civil market as well. A couple of things first. Uh, we are recording this, so we'll make it available to everyone to review afterwards or, or to share it with your co-workers. Uh, we will be posting it on your YouTube channel where you guys can access these videos as well as all kinds of other technical videos. So the easiest way is to go to our website and click on the YouTube icon at the top of the page. So with this being our first Civil 3D Best Practice Series, I thought I'll just introduce what these are about and why we're doing this. So. We're gonna run this every week on Tuesday, and it's a way for us to keep all of you guys up to date with Civil 3D. And we're gonna show a compilation of industry best practices for different features. So today topics will be alignments, and this is the agenda we have created for you. We're gonna do a brief introduction. Then we're gonna talk about essential alignment creation techniques. Alignment for cul de sacs, alignments for rivers and compound curves, alignment for profiles, alignment and profiles for bus bay and passing lanes, and finish up with a QA. By the way, we're going to do QA, but we're not going to open up for audio because there's a lot of us in this webinar. But feel free to type them in the question section on your go to webinar panel. We will address them along the way, and if it makes sense, for the most part, we're going to take those at the end of the broadcast. As many as you know, we are part of the cancer group of companies, and that allows us to offer other solutions from our partner companies, ensuring that you have access to all your software and hardware needs. For 20 years, we've been helping organizations make things faster, increase their margins, and reduce business risk to some of our professional services like training, data management, workflow assessments, and optimizations. We specialize in technology that support multiple industry, including architecture, construction, engineering, civil infrastructure, and manufacturing. We have the largest team of industry experts across Canada, all time zones, both official languages. So these are some of our partner products that we work with. We have Autodesk and the Architecture Engineering and Construction Solutions, Bluebeam with the review solution. For those who don't know, is a PDF creation and collaboration technology specific for our industry. This product comes very handy for virtual meetings, especially now being self-isolated at home. We have here also CTC tools with the productivity tools for Civil and Revit and our safe software, which is a data integration platform. So our industry team have come together with a bunch of service bundles that contains a variety of tools and services like this one, go live with Binter 60 Designs in Doc. So customers were looking for a BIM-centric platform that collaborates and connect design and construction processes and your project teams in one place, this is the bundle for you. We have also Bluebeam bundles. If you're looking to implement Bluebeam in your workflow, train the staff and encourage team collaboration, this is the bundle that are worth investing in. And finally, our Accelerate to Beam bundle that embraces the functionality of Civil 3D and wraps a combination of training and professional services. Before we start with our technical content, I would like to show you a little bit of what we have for you in the next upcoming days and weeks. We have our next Civil 3D best practice series, which are corridors next week and the in pipe and pressure networks in the following week. We also launched our productivity workshops, which are enhanced targeted half day lecture style sessions. 
designed to demonstrate efficient workflows and tips about our advanced civil 3D topics. And finally, our classic courses. You, you all know about our courses. Now they are being delivered remotely. So a student will be attending the classes via internet connection from their home or office. Please, I invite you to, to visit our event section in our website for a full description and registration. Now I'm gonna hand over to Matt, who's gonna talk about civil 3D best practices when working with alignments. Matt, please. Thank you, Saeed. Welcome everybody to the first in the series of best practices. Let me just share my screen. All right, so you should be seeing a SolidCAD PowerPoint slide called Alignments Best Practices. Um, before we get going, just a little bit of housekeeping. The GoToWebinar interface uh, on the, should be on the right side of your screen, has lots of tabs, has uh, questions tabs, a chat tab, a handout tab. Um, the PowerPoint that you're about to see me present is available via handout. So feel free to go to the handout section and download this PowerPoint. Uh, we'll be running a couple of polls throughout the webinar as well. Uh, not that you'll have to do anything, it's just gonna pop up on your screen and just answer as you would normally. If you have questions, please post them in the questions tab. Um, there's a chat tab there too, or at least there should be. Um, feel free to chat amongst yourselves that way, but if you have a question, um, Colin uh, Godet is one of my technical consultants. He's going to be answering your questions during the webinar in the questions tab, so please ask them in there. Colin, you good to go? I am. Got Very a couple nice. questions coming in, but uh, nothing uh, related to alignments quite yet. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so on that note, we will begin. So I will show you some things for maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so. We'll have a quick look at the questions pan panel, see how many Colin has had to answer. Um, we'll go over some of them in case, you know, maybe you have a similar question. And so if we seem to have answered a question already, then that means you just don't have to ask it again. All right, so let's get started. So today's gonna to be sort of split up into four major bundles. First, we'll start with creation techniques, how to create alignments from polylines, how to create them when you don't have a polyline. We'll talk about the parametric constraints that Civil 3D employs with alignments, how to use them and, and how to modify them to some degree. We're not gonna go into super advanced territory here, it's just it's best practices. Then we'll rock, rock into cul-de-sacs. Then we'll move into reverse and compound curves, and finally bus bays and parking lanes, or sorry, passing lanes. All right, this is not gonna be death by PowerPoint. I'm definitely going to be showing you Civil 3D, and let's get started. All right, let me close this guy up here. All right, first section, we're gonna talk about creating alignments from objects. Best practices, there's two. One, you need to ensure your polyline has perfect tangency. After that, there's something called solve PI. Uh, I'll get to that when we get to it. Let's talk about tangency first. Now, what I mean by tangency, All right, if I create a basic polyline here and run the fillet command on it, I created that polyline, I've used the fillet tool, this polyline is perfect tangency. If I move this over here, this is what I mean by not being tangent. Now, this is obvious. It's obviously not tangent, but, oops, I got rid of my curve. But if I were to move this even one millimeter, it's not 
perfect tangency. So how do you know? Well, if you're the one that created the polyline and you just ran the fillet command, you're pretty sure that it's going to be perfectly tangent. But in this case, I've got a yellow polyline. Maybe I don't know that it's perfectly tangent, and there's really no way for me to know right now until I make the alignment. So I'll make the alignment from objects. By the way, I get a lot of questions during my classes and during these types of webinars. You know, should I be creating alignments from Polyline or, or should I be using these tools? A lot of people think these tools, you know, that's it. If you want to be a good alignment person, use those tools. Um, no, that's totally not the case. You know what? If you already have the Polyline drawn, go ahead and make an alignment from it. There's really no reason to trace over it with a brand new alignment when you already have the polyline. If you don't have a polyline, well, it's probably actually easier to use the Civil 3D layout tools to make it because there's a tool in there that creates polylines, sorry, creates alignments in a similar feel to you creating polylines. I'll show you that in a second. So if you're humming and hawing over which tool to use, do I make a polyline first or do I use the layout tools? Again, if you already have the polyline, use it. And that's what I'm going to do. All right, I'll give it a name. Got to name everything in Civil 3D, of course. Uh, labels, don't really care about. This one already has a curve, so I don't need to add a new curve to it. I'll hit OK. That is how I know that it was not perfectly tangent. It's a warning message. If I hover my cursor on it, it tells me that my tangency is violated. So what do we do about it? Well, I could undo and fix the polyline, or I could just fix it right now. Um, but guess what? You may not get this. That's a setting that has to be turned on. Okay, so. I'm going to go into the alignment properties here. All right, there's there's masking, there's point of intersection, contrast editing, design criteria. All right, right here, for each alignment properties, we have to turn this on. Check for tangency. If yours isn't turned on, you're not going to be notified that your tangency is being violated. Also, that's one of two. The second setting is part of the alignment style itself. Warning symbol. If that's off, again, you're not going to see the warnings. So to see these tangency warnings, two things have to happen. In fact, this is probably the most common reason some users decide it's, it's maybe a bad idea to create alignments from polylines because of the potential tangency problem but there's really an easy way to fix it. So I now have a curve and a line that are, not, that are not tangent to each other. What I need to do is open the alignment geometry editor first. Then I need to open the grid view because that is gonna point me in the direction of every single object that makes up my alignment. So row number one, is a line, row number two is a curve, and row number three is a line again. We also get the exclamation point that indicates that we have a tangency problem. Now what I need to switch to fix it is this guy right here. When you create an alignment using the layout tools, everything is automatically tangent, assuming you do it the right way. And because this curve is not constrained, that's why it's there's no guarantee that it's tangent. We need to change this so that it's constrained to both lines. It's called a free constraint. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But I can come in here and change the constraint to be free. Now, if you notice, but my tangency warning is now gone. It is perfectly tangent. So, no problem. If you create alignment from objects, and you have a tangency problem, usually what I just showed you is the answer. Depending on the nature of your exact alignment, 
you may need to employ a couple of different techniques, but that by far is the most common. Go in, set the curve to be free, no more tangency problems. Scenario number two. We have created an alignment from polyline. Our tangency is perfect but we get behavior that maybe isn't exactly what you want, right? I'm going to edit that point in the alignment. I'm gonna drag it down here someplace. And what most people will expect to see is the point of intersection, or PI, uh, being held. But it's not gonna happen this way. Watch this. I'll move that down to here. Clearly, the point of intersection was not held. What was held? It's still tangent. There's the line, there's the curve, everything is still all perfectly tangent. What happened was the line endpoint was held. That's sort of another reason some people choose not to create alignments from polylines is because the grip editing behavior isn't exactly what they expect. And here's why. When you create an alignment from a polyline, there is no point of intersection. The line is defined from here to here. The curve is defined from here to here, and so on. When you create an alignment using the layout tools, you're actually defining a line segment from PI to PI. And so there is a point of intersection there. But because we've created an alignment from a polyline, there is no point of intersection. So it's not bad or good, it's just this is the behavior that you can expect when first creating an alignment from polyline. The PI is not held, but that's not what people want. Most designers would prefer the PI to be held, and so we can do this. When I select the alignment, I get what's called I don't know, I'm gonna call it a phantom point of intersection. It's called an implied point of intersection. Um, now, you may not get that implied point of intersection. Another setting in the alignment properties under point of intersection is right there. I get an implied point of intersection when the alignment changes direction. I'll circle this one in red if your alignment properties has that one set, you will not even see the implied intersection. So it's very important that this setting be turned on as well. Assuming the settings turned on, it is dead easy to make this thing behave the way you want it to. I'll zoom in on my implied point of intersection. I just hover, I don't click. I just hover on that implied grip and I choose solve PI. There it is, that's it. This alignment now behaves exactly the way most people want it to. I'll move this guy down here. The point of intersection is indeed held and we're happy. All right, what's next? Layout tools. Now I'm gonna take a break just for a second. It's about quarter after. Uh, Colin, any questions of note? We are free and clear of questions so far. Ah, very good, very good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Colin. All right, I'll continue. All right, so that's creating an alignment from a polyline. Let's talk about creating it from layout tools. I'll use the same drawing. Um, when I teach the Civil 3D class, I talk about making alignments from polylines. I talk about making them from layout tools. And again, if you already have the polyline, just use it, make an alignment from it. But if you don't, go ahead and think about making alignments from layout. Instead of going to the extra step of making the polyline first and then converting it to alignment, let's just make an alignment first. I'll call it road A. If there's a lot of buttons here and people, some people get maybe intimidated by the fact that there's a zillion buttons on this toolbar. 
when I teach alignments for the first time, I really focus on four buttons. So I'm not going to talk about all those buttons right now. But for you, for the future, if you're sort of trying to get used to this toolbar, I'm going to point to those four buttons right now. First one, just create the alignment with tangents and curves. Just like you're making a polyline, you go click, 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 click. You're creating PIs. And if you choose tangents and curves, those PIs are going to have curves. So that's generally how we start making alignments from scratch using this toolbar. After that, if you have to add a brand new point of intersection, it's that button. So if I want a new PI right here, I want my alignment to do that. Insert PI. If I want to get rid of a PI, I use that button. All right, we're three quarters of the way there. There's only one more button that I'm going to show you. Thing is, when you get Civil 3D to add a PI like this one, it's not going to put a curve in for us. You might think well, it should. Well, not necessarily. Alignments could be anything. It could be a road. And yeah, if it's a road, it needs a curve. But if it's a curb line or if it's a top of berm, let's say, we don't necessarily need a curve. So every time you add a PI, you need to add a curve. In fact, I'm going to show this one off real quick. I'll make a new point of intersection right there. As you can see, no curve. This by far, this is the fourth button, by the way. There's other curve tools, yes, and I'll talk about them a little bit in a, in a second. But for points of intersection, this is by far the most common tool you're going to use. It's, a, it's almost like the fillet command, but of course it's an alignment, so we can't use the AutoCAD fillet command. So I'll use the free fillet. All right, let me check it out. Pick the line before, pick the line after. So less than, what's the radius? I have no idea. I'm going to try 200. Okay, 200 works. That's it. There's the four buttons. I would say, in my experience, the majority of users get away with these four buttons. That one, insert PI, delete PI, and then add a curve. If you're into highways, you're going to use some of the other spiral buttons probably. Uh, and if you start wanting to really get into this, you're going to use some of the other constraints as well. But when you're starting, these are the four buttons that you're probably going to use. Now, constraints. These are parametric constraints. And what that means is you give it some parameters and the alignment is constrained to those parameters. So. My first one is called a line. It's a fixed line. It's, it's not constrained to anything. The second one, however, is a curve that is constrained on both sides. Now, a constraint on both sides is called a free constraint. It's constrained on both sides. So for example, this curve right here, it's constrained on both sides. Basically, what that long and short of what that means is it's always going to maintain tangency. Any change I make to the line before or the line after, that curve is constrained to both this line and this line. Because it's constrained on both sides, it's a free constraint. But it doesn't have to be constrained on both sides. And you do not have to create your alignments from beginning to end in all cases. All right, here's another example. That's station zero. My alignment is going to go all the way over to here someplace. I've designed half of it. There's a big rock face here that I want to avoid. There's some places in this alignment that I, I really need my alignment to pass through. Other places, it's like, man, I don't really need. It's, I've got some play area. My point is, I don't have to do this curve next, and then this line, and then this curve, and then that curve, and then this line. I don't have to do that in that order. I can design my alignment in any order I want. I fix in the individual pieces that need to be at a specific place, and then I join them up. All right, you'll see what I mean in a second. All right, I'm editing this alignment. Now, what I need 
I need to finish on this line. Maybe there's an intersection here, there's this constraint, I've got a, a berm or a ditch or something, some low point, I need to put my alignment inside. I definitely need it to go in there. So I'm gonna add what's called a fixed line. It's just, it's not constrained at all. I pick two points and I get a line in between those two points. There. It's still part of the alignment. When I select it, you see the entire alignment is now selected. There's no labels on it because it's not connected to the rest of the alignment. But it's still part of the alignment. Once I connect this up, then everything's going to be good. All right. Next, I'll go over to here. Uh, I know that I want a curve here someplace. Maybe I'll start the curve at the end. I don't know. I know the radius, but I don't know maybe how long it is. So I'm just going to guess. Now, this curve is going to be constrained on one side. Remember, constrained means tangent. So it's going to be tangent to, to this line on one side. A constraint that is fixed, or sorry, a curve that's constrained on one side is a floating curve. So free curves are constrained on both sides. Floating curves are constrained on one side. And so to add curves, here's the three different options. We got fixed curves, which aren't constrained to anything. Floating curves, which are constrained on one side, and free curves, which are constrained on both sides. And there's lots of different options for constrained curves. I can attach this curve to an entity. I can choose a radius. I can choose a through point. Now, it's from entity. Notice it, it doesn't say from the end of an entity. So somewhere along that entity, if I want to constrain it to the end, I can choose this or that. Now for me, I want my curve to begin at the end of that line. I want to type in a radius. I don't know the length right now, and it doesn't really matter. But that's the tool I'm going to use, the second one. All right, here we go. From the end of this line. Clockwise, yes. Radius, uh, 200, I think. Length, again, I have no idea what the length is. In fact, I'm just going to pick two points. There's my length. It's too long, too short, maybe. I don't know. It looks okay. Maybe it's the radius I don't like. So, no problem. I can come to the grid editor. Find the appropriate curve. That's not it. There it is. Radius 200. No, let's try 100. Good enough. Does it matter that it goes this long? No, not at all. Remember, we're creating our alignment iteratively. I add the different pieces. The fact that it's this long doesn't matter. What's going to happen? There's going to be a straight line that connects this. There's going to be another curve here and here. So for now, I'll just leave it as is. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to fix in. There's going to be a curve right here. I want to go around this rock face to some degree. Now, there's nothing to constrain it here. There's no tangent in or a tangent out. So that's going to be a fixed curve. And the tool I use depends on what I know about that curve. Three points doesn't really help me because I want a, a normal radius. So anything with the word radius in it. Two points in radius, quite possibly. Do I know where the center point is? Um, maybe, maybe not. So I'm going to try two points in radius and see what that does. There's not necessarily a right answer to all these things. Star point, that circle. Radius. Mm, I'll try 250. Direction clockwise, yes. End point. There. Okay. That's not too bad. Maybe the radius is a little large. Or maybe it's just fine. Let's see. What I'm going to do is I'll erase it. And I'll just start. Oops. 
uh, race sub entity, there it is. And maybe I'll just try it again. Two points radius. Let's try 75. Okay, that seems reasonable to me. So which pieces do we fix in? Fix that in, we fix this in. This was just sort of an extension of the other part of the alignment, so I'm not gonna say we fix that one in. But now all we need to do is connect these, these three parts, because I created these three parts for a particular reason. Now I just need to connect them in. All I need is a line from here to here. Now this line is constrained on both ends. It's constrained to this curve and it's constrained to that curve. So because it's constrained to both ends, it's a free curve, sorry, a free line. It's attached to this curve, it's attached to that curve. Ah, now you can see what's going on. Once everything's connected, I get the appropriate labels. And then finally, essentially, I just want a fillet command to connect these two up. Because it's constrained on both sides again, it's a free curve. Constraint one, constraint two. Is it a reverse or compound? This would be a reverse curve. What's my radius? 75. There it is. Alignment is complete. So to wrap up this part, remember, you do not have to create your alignment in its entirety from the start to the end. You can fix in different pieces as you see fit and then just start connecting things up, usually with free lines and free curves. Moving all the call to sacks now, uh, might as well take a look at those questions. Colin, anything of note? No, nope, Matt, you're doing a great job. No questions so far. Holy crap. All right, well, in that case, let's start engaging the audience a little bit. I'm curious. I'm going to say how, I'm going to ask, that is, how you create your alignments, all right? So what you're going to see on your screen is a pop-up any second now on how you create your alignments. So take the next several seconds, answer how you normally create your alignments. Lines, curves, polylines, do you like to use the layout tools? Or do you use both, depending on the situation? All right, it's a race between lines, curves, polylines, and both. And we are done, everyone's already answered. Okay, so I'll close the poll, and I'll share the poll so you can see it. Here's how everybody answered. So alignment layout tools is only 5%, but that's okay, the bottom one I'm actually happy with, both depending on the situation. Right, 42% of everybody here depends on what they do, and that's perfect. So for those 53% on top, lines, curves, polylines, remember, that's just fine. Depending on the nature of your alignment, if you already have that polyline, what you're doing is perfectly fine. Um, what I'm gonna show next, however, cul-de-sacs, it's really quite important that you do not create a cul-de-sac with a polyline because you're gonna have tangency problems all over the place. Now, one more, uh, you know what? I'm gonna ask that question later. Okay, call the sex. Um, by the way, when you download this PowerPoint file, there's a couple of pages, this one and the next one, that are gonna have a picture that's sort of like this. That's a link to my Autodesk knowledge base channel. I've recorded 37-ish videos up there, and, and that's a link to my video that talks about this exactly. So if you want to learn a bit more after this webinar, feel free to uh, click on those links. All right, cul-de-sac begins with the bulb, right? So here, number one at the bottom, I'm pointing at the bulb, that's what you do first. Right, then you create your, what is essentially edges of pavement, 
and then finally you create the uh, little radii that connect the edge of pavement to the to the bulb. Now you might ask, well, why do I need this even? Can we just draw this with, excuse me, AutoCAD tools and then show it on my plans? Absolutely. But if you're going to create a corridor for this cul-de-sac, you need this alignment to follow your edge of travel way or your edge of pavement. So if you're not doing a corridor, uh, you don't need to do this. I still might though, because it gives me some, some pretty cool flexibility later. All right, demo time. Right, I'm gonna close all these drawings, because don't need them anymore. Open my cul-de-sac file. Okay, here we are. Right, so what I want to do is right there, that is an offset of my alignment. I need that. You'll see why in just a minute, but I'm, I'm going to offset my alignment by, let's say, three or four meters either side. Whatever your lane width is, I'm going to offset. those. When you offset an alignment, you end up with polylines. So I'm going to snap to those. Uh, in a second. So first, I'm going to make my cul-de-sac alignment. There it is. Um, labels, sure. So I mentioned we needed to start with the bulb. Do I need to start with the bulb? Not necessarily. I could start with this edge of pavement here or I could start with this edge of pavement, or I could start with the bulb. It doesn't necessarily matter which, which one you choose. Very important that you draw them in the proper direction, however. So I'm a counterclockwise kind of guy. So I would typically start with this, and I draw that line in that direction. And for my bulb, I'll draw it counterclockwise. And then this piece I'll draw in that direction. If you draw these in the wrong direction, they're not going to hook up and you're not going to get labels properly. So I'm going to start with the bulb, however. And because it's not constrained, I'm going to use a fixed curve. So what do I know about the curve? Well, I know where the center point is, and I know what the radius is. So that's why I use this particular constraint. Center point. Center of this. Clockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise, because that's the type of guy I am. Radius, 20 meters, or whatever your ball of radius should be. Now I know it's a circle, because that's all I gave it. Where is station zero? I don't know yet. I'm not sure that it really matters just yet. But that's my bulb. Next, I'm going to create the line along my edge of pavement on the south side. Now, I don't go over here because this is creating lines and curves together as if you're making a polyline. I don't want that one. I just want a line. And because it's not constrained, I want it to be a fixed line. Where do I put this? Doesn't matter. It can be 300 meters long. It just doesn't matter. There. In fact, it's, it's way too short. What's going to happen? You know, my little fillet right here, my 10 meter fillet, doesn't start until here. It doesn't matter that I've drawn it way over here. Now, the third piece I'll make on the other side. Again, drawing it in the proper direction. That was drawn here. This was drawn counterclockwise. That was drawn that way. Okay, we're just about done, in fact. Last thing is that little fillet, the little free curve that connects the line and my bulb. Because it's constrained on both sides, it's a free curve. There it is, between two entities and a radius. First constraint. 
that piece of the alignment. Second constraint, the bulb. Less than 180, is it compound or reverse? It's reverse because they go in different directions. What's the radius? 10. All right, I might as well do the other curve while I'm at it. What's the first constraint? This time it's the bulb because that's the direction we're going in. Where's the next constraint? My line. It's also reverse and it's the same radius. There it is, everything's all connected up. You see my labels go all the way around. Call this act done. Now you might have said, well, you know, Matt, I can, I can do this with AutoCAD tools, you know, offset, trim, extend, fill it. Yep, you could, but watch what happens. I'm gonna offset my new alignment by one. And uh, I'll just move this over so you can see a little better. Oops. If you were to make an alignment from this polyline and you started to, maybe you, you decided you wanted to make the bulb a different radius. So you started to grip edit things. That's not good. That's not good. The way I've edited this is exactly how your alignment would behave. We now have tangency problems all over the place. So sure, you know, and, and I'm never gonna tell anybody you did it the wrong way, okay? If you can make an alignment of a cul-de-sac bulb and it works for you, you've done something right. So that's fantastic. However, quite often there's better ways to do it that make it more efficient for editing later. So the, the way I've just shown you this way is not really good for editing after the fact. But doing it this way, I can edit this thing all I want and nothing bad's gonna happen. So watch this. Let's say I change my mind. My road isn't four meters anymore. It's, I don't know, six. Right, I've changed the offset of that piece of road. I'm still tangent. Or maybe I want to change the radius of this. Still tangent. Maybe I even want to change the location of the bulb. Take the center point and move it over just a little bit. All the curves are still tangent. Nothing's broken. No need to go in and, and fix everything. Or worse, what, what I've seen happen, because I do a lot of technical support, I'll have a customer call up and say, well, every time I have to change the cul-de-sac, I erase the alignment and recreate another one. Well, that's gonna wreak havoc on your corridor because your corridor is this dynamic thing that's, that's linked with your alignment. And so if you're erasing your alignment, you're erasing your corridor. So using the appropriate constraints for cul-de-sacs, and then making edits to it is completely the best way to do it. Most efficient for editing after the fact. All right, reverse curves. Actually, Matt, can I jump in with uh, a good question that we can address for everyone? Yes, absolutely, go ahead. Awesome. Um, so we've got a question here. Uh, when trying to best fit an alignment to match an existing road alignment, how would you go about approaching that? Uh, a best fit to match an existing road alignment? So yes. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of best fit options. So if I go under here, I've got create best fit alignment. So there's, there's two basic things. There's a best fit alignment, but then there's also best fit subcomponents or best fit constraints, right? So there's a, a fixed line best fit, there's a floating line best fit, pretty much, uh, is there curves? Yeah, fixed curve, floating curve, free curve. So there's best fits for each of the subcomponents, and there's also a best fit for the alignment itself. So 
you sort of have to choose if do you want to do a best fit for your entire alignment or do you want to do a best fit for just a small little piece of it? That's your first choice you have to make. Um, so let's let's say you choose this one, best fit for the entire alignment. Um, when you choose a best fit for the entire alignment, you, you, you choose input types, right? Are there blocks that are inserted maybe at the center of your road? Are there AutoCAD entities? Are there AutoCAD points? Are there civil 3D points? Or maybe it's a feature line that you've connected your your survey with. So you pick that as an input input type. And then you decide, you know, do you want a minimum radius? Do you want to use spirals? And then the rest, you know, your alignment name and all that stuff. And so uh, is, without going into too much more detail, that is how everything is started. And so after that, you know, after you create it, you can adjust the weight of each of those things. So for example, um, if you have, let's say a feature line and you have a block and you definitely need your alignment to go right through that spot, you can you can put extra weight on that one data point so that your alignment definitely goes through there, but the rest of it can float based on other best fit uh, parameters. So that's about as far as I can answer it so far. Um, Whoever asked that question, good question, by the way. If you need a, a more detailed answer or something to do with your own personal scenario, uh, feel free to email us afterwards, and then we can look at your uh, specific case. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, Colin. Thank you. Where is that? Oh, yes, reverse curves. Reverse curves. Uh, reverse and compound curves, they are very similar. The technique is practically exactly the same. And it's another one of those things, just like cul-de-sacs, where it would behoove you to use the appropriate constraints for the purposes of editing after. Again, no problem. You know, if you are comfortable making polylines and you can make a polyline with a reverse or com compound curve, Feel free, go ahead. I'm not going to tell you you did it wrong. But you're not going to be able to edit it very easily after. Hence, using the appropriate constraints. All right. I have some of my alignment done already. You probably recognize that. There we are. So what I want to have happen is I want a curve not necessarily attached to the end of this line, just anywhere along this line. But I do want that curve to pass through that point right there. And then I have my other line. So which one do I do first? It doesn't really matter. I'm gonna do the line first just because I can. That's a fixed line, just like the one we did for the cul-de-sac. I'm drawing it in the proper direction from left to right in this case. Uh, this particular alignment style, I've chosen to turn on the arrows which makes it nice for you. You can tell which direction each piece has been drawn in to help you design. Next, I need this curve right here. Because it's constrained on one side, it's a floating curve. I'm gonna use a different one this time. I'm gonna use this one. Because I don't care that it's not maybe snapped to the end of the alignment, just somewhere along the alignment. I do want to specify a radius, and I do want to specify that blue circle as my through point. So, which entity to attach to? Which constraint? There. What's my radius? I'm going to pick 200 again. Let's see if that's right. Is it less than or greater than? It's always less than just about. What's my end point? I'll pick that center. So far, so good. There's only one more thing to do. Connect these two up. And it's constrained on both sides, right? It's constrained to this curve, and it's constrained to that line segment. Because it's constrained on both sides, it's a free curve. Pick the first constraint. Pick the second constraint. Less than 180. Now it says it's a compound. Sorry, yes, compound or reverse. It's reverse because they go in different directions. What's my new radius? 
200. There it is. Yeah, you could do this with a polyline, but if you did, you'd not be able to do this. I can take this line now and move it anywhere I want, change the angle, change the radii of any of these curves, and everything is going to still maintain tangency. So that's the beauty of using the parametric constraints for alignment as, as opposed to using just regular polylines. It's the editing after the fact. All right, I'll do the same thing, except this time it's going to be with a compound curve. The idea is a bit different, but the technique is exactly the same. In fact, the three different tools are exactly the same. All right, I will close my other drawings because I don't need them open. So here's our goal. We have a line here, we have a line here. We need to connect those two lines with two curves, not just a regular fillet. It's two different curves. Oops. This curve has a larger radius. That curve has a smaller radius. Um, you'll sometimes see these instead of using a spiral sometimes, or when you're doing a when you're designing a, a deceleration lane or an acceleration lane. Sometimes you'll have uh, compound curves. It's the curves, two curves going in the same direction with different radii. So that's already done. In my case, I'll create this, this line second. I'll do this curve third. I'll do that curve fourth. But that's our goal. By the way, um, here's that link to the video. In case you'd like to download the handout, go ahead and click that button. Open up the geometry editor, another fixed line, just like we did before. Center to center. Another floating curve, just like we did before, except this time, I think I do want to use the alignment end radius length. Attach to here, direction clockwise this time. Radius, I'm going to try 60. Length, not really sure. Let's do that. Okay, that's perfect. That's typically how compound curves work. The first curve is so big that it extends past where your line is. And then when we finish this up, as we have another smaller radius that connects these two. That's going to be constrained on both sides, constrained to this curve, constrained to that tangent. Both sides constraints means you got it, free curve fillet. Constrained to this curve first, constrained to this entity next. Compound or reverse, this time I get to use compound. What's my radius? Well, it's something smaller than the other one. The other one was 60, this one, I'll try 30. There it is. Um, I've labeled it so that we can see point on compound curve. There's a midpoint. There's a tangency point. Just so I can see where the curves meet. And where the two curves meet is right there. That's the 60 meter radius. That's the 30. And again, it's just about editing after. Any change I make will result in everything working out just right, assuming. I move it within reason. If I move this way over here, that's not exactly what I want. It still draws it based on those constraints, but that's not what I want ex exactly. So um, if I needed to move it over here, really what, what should have happened, this curve should have slid along the alignment that way, and so I should have used a different constraint. So the constraint that you use depends on your situation. 
but at this point I can do some pretty significant editing and uh, and I won't get those tangency errors we saw in the beginning Mr. Colin, how is our questions coming along? We're doing great so far. Uh, I've got, uh, I've had a couple comments of people liking your, uh, I believe it's Zoom it that you're using to, to zoom in and out. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I get that all the time when I teach. So if you're, if you're wondering how I'm drawing like that and how I'm zooming in on the screen and then drawing stuff like this, uh, it's, it's a piece of software called Zoom it. And I'm glad that people ask the question, but I get slightly offended because instead of saying, you know, good job with the demonstration, no, what's that Zoom It software you use instead? No, I don't really get offended. But uh, no, it's, um, you know, sometimes I have to work on, on small drawings with, with, with computers with small text and, and I don't see all that well. And so that just even just allows me to zoom in to see stuff too. So good, you got a handle on all the questions. Uh, anything I should talk about with the rest of the, the class or are we good? Actually, I do have one more. Um, okay, good. <clears throat> we're asking about compound versus reverse curves. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we just go over kind of the definition of each of those one more time? Oh yeah, for sure. Let's go back. All right, so a reverse curve is when you have two back-to-back -back curves, right? There's a curve here that ends here, and another curve that starts exactly where the first curve ends, but it goes in a different direction, right? So this first curve, if we're going from north to south, that first curve would be clockwise. Then it meets the second curve here, and the second curve is counterclockwise. So that's what a reverse curve is. It's two back-to-back -back curves, going in different directions. One's clockwise, one's counterclockwise. A compound curve is still two curves back to back, but they both go in the same direction, right? There's where the curves meet. That's a 60 meter radius going clockwise. That's a 30 meter radius also going clockwise. That's it, reverse is two curves back to back that go in different directions. Compound, two curves back to back, back to back that go in the same direction. There's a definition of reverse versus compound. That's great. Thanks, Matt. And okay, if Colin. we have any other questions about that, we can kind of reach out afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, so I'll finish off today with alignment offsets. It's just a hair after one o'clock. We'll be done about 1.15 or so. We'll see if there's any more questions at that point. Uh, and then Syed will, uh, Syed will, will close it off. So let's finish it off with alignment offsets. It's probably time for another poll question. Let's see. So this question is about fixed floating or free alignment constraints. So the question is, have you ever used fixed floating alignment components? I don't have free in there, but consider it added. Have you used free as well? All right. Man, you guys are fast. Almost everybody's answered already. All right, 62 and 38 is 100, so everybody has answered. Thank you. We'll close this and we'll share it. Here's the uh, results. So 38% have used flex, fl fixed floating or free components and 62% have not. And again, that's totally fine. I don't know what your typical design scenario is. So if it makes more sense to just use a polyline, then uh, go ahead and do it. If your highways, if you're cul-de-sacs and you haven't used fixed or floating or free constraints, it's probably time you should start just because everything's gonna be a lot easier to edit after the fact. Cool, thank you. We'll hide that one. Uh, 
uh, last poll. When you design bus bays and parking lanes, do you use the typical AutoCAD offset trim extends tools? Do you use the offset alignment tool? Or alignment offset what now? Basically the third one, have you, have you ever heard of the alignment offset tool basically? If you've never heard of it, go ahead and click the last one. Okay, it's a race. We've got 42% so far, 2633. And that's 100%. You guys are so good. Okay, I'll close this and I'll share the results. There we are. So bus bays, passing lanes, 40% use the AutoCAD tools, 26% understand how the alignment offset tool works, and 34% maybe have not heard about what the alignment offset tool is. Fantastic, thank you very much. I will hide that poll. So that tells me how much detail I need to go in with alignment offsets. All right, here we go. I want my bus bay right here. Now, sure, you could use the AutoCAD offset tool, offset the alignment, draw some lines, use trim and extend, use fillet, but that's just a lot of work. I'm gonna use the alignment offset tool. I start by selecting my main alignment. I will say offset. I'm gonna pick three meters on each side. I want one on the left, one on the right, but I don't have to. I can have as many on the left and as many on the right as I want. I'll make them both three. So right now, what's going to happen, I've got one lane eastbound and one lane westbound. Each of them is three meters wide. Hit OK. There's my alignment offsets. Now you might say, well, I could have done that with, with the uh, offset command. True but it would not be dynamic. Any change I make to this alignment will result in those two alignment offsets dynamically editing. Around curves, around straight lines, doesn't matter. It's a dynamic offset. So that's one reason why I like it. Now, what about that bus bay thing? Well, I want my bus bay to go here someplace. I want it to be between, let's say, 520 and 540 on the south side. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to come out like this, it's going to go this way, it's going to go back. That's it. So I'll pick the offset that I want to create a widening for, and that's the word, that's the operative word. That's the alignment I want to create a widening for. There's the widening button right there. Do I want to make the widening piece a new alignment? No, I want to be part of this one. Start station. Let's go, I don't know, 500. End station, 540. What's the new offset? Six. Not, not an extra three. If I said three, it would have just been three. It would have been the same as everything else. So I had to say six. There it is. There's our bus bay. How fast was that? Seriously. Now, is it the exact right shape I want? Maybe, maybe not. But right now, it's pretty quick without any offsets or trimming. Okay, so what can I do with it? Well, I'm going to slide this over here. And I will right-click it, and I'll choose Offset Parameters. Shoot. Sorry about that, there we go. Now, here's my interface for my offsets. I have a transition in, I have a widened region, and I have a transition out. And when I click each one of those three regions, it highlights for me in plan which region I'm dealing with. So for that region in, right now it's a curve line and a curve. The transition length is 25 meters, and I've got eight meter radii. What if I don't want that? I just want a total line. I don't want any curves. Completely linear, 25 meters, maybe that's too much. Maybe I want five meter transition. 
depending on the nature of your particular bus bay, it's pretty easy to make these changes. Maybe five's not big enough. Maybe 10 is the right number. Perfect, okay. And so for the widened region, maybe you know that your bus is 20 meters long. And so you can type in the required length here, 20 meters. And then the transition out, maybe I'll use the same as before. It's a line transition with a 10 meter length. So in less than 30 seconds after you've practiced this tool, in less than 30 seconds, you now have a bus bay, which again is dynamic. Any change I make to the center line alignment, if I move this segment over here, say, that bus bay remembers everything about itself. It remembers what station it started at. It remembers the linear transition lengths. It remembers all the parameters. Essentially, it's like parameter constraints again. It remembers all that stuff. No offsetting, no trimming, no filleting. It's just there. Why would I want this exactly? Well, for your plans, certainly, and then for your corridor. If you need to use that as a corridor target, there you go. Now, the other thing we can do with alignment offset widening is to create a passing lane. So I'll do the same thing on the south side here. All right, there's my white south side offset. Now I'm going to do this one a little bit different. I'm not going to actually click the add widening piece. I could. I'm going to actually click this plus. Because when you select your offset alignment, you have two grips. You have a plus and you have that. That triangle grip allows you to type in a new offset. So I'm going to turn on my dynamic input. I'll hover on that thing for a second. If I click on it, it's going to allow me to type in a brand new offset. Whatever I type in, that's going to be my offset. This plus adds a brand new widening. There it is. Now, does that look like passing lane? Not really. Uh, where do I want it to start? Well, I don't want to start the passing lane in a curve, so I'm going to slide that grip over here. All right, that's where I want my passing lane to start. Um, I want it to be an extra three meters, so I want a six meter total. So in the middle of that section should be that triangular grip. There it is. As long as my dynamic input is on, I can just type in six. And I now have a six meter lane. Uh oh. I didn't type six. Six, there we go. Not sure what I typed before, but it wasn't six. Now, the last thing I have to worry about is my transition length. Right now, there's only one little gray grip there, but when I click that gray grip, I get some other grips. And right here, just arbitrarily picking the region length. And that may or may not be good enough for your passing lane, but it probably isn't. So I'll go back up to and right click um, my Offset parameters. Now I do have a second widening group now. I need to click this widening group to see my passing lane. And there's my transition in, linear. Right now it's set to 29 meters, but I, I know as a, as a highways guy, maybe I want it to be 30 to one. So, but I don't want to do math. Math is hard. Let's get the software to do it. So I'll pick taper ratio and I'll type 30. Again, no math, no offsetting, no trimming, no filleting, and I now have a passing lane. Um, by the way, had I started that passing lane in the curve, Civil 3D would have just done it. I mean, how, how do you create geometry as a 30 to one taper ratio in the middle of a curve? I don't know, software does. Software does it really nicely. Most passing lanes don't start in a curve, though, so I just chose not to do it that way.
So alignment offsets for bus bays, alignment offsets for passing lanes, makes pretty quick work of it. Now the last thing I'm gonna show you today is about one more offset. And it's a, a reasonably new feature for Civil 3D. Now, I do need to have a profile. So I'm gonna quickly create a surface profile and a design profile. Bear with me for a moment. I can't see it, but it's there. Let me move this to the back so I can actually see my profile. There it is. Apparently my grid is a little bit too dense. All right, I'll make a design profile here. Now, I'm not gonna go into any detail. I'm just gonna make it really simple. It's gonna start here and it's gonna finish here. Not much of a design, but this is about offsets, not my design. I'm gonna create another alignment offset. I'll make this one 10 meters on the left, and I don't want one on the right. Now, if I just hit OK, that's a horizontal alignment offset only, but there's another option here. I can create, not only can I create the horizontal 10 meter offset, but at the same time, I can create a brand new offset profile based on my design profile placed in my profile view at zero, uh, or sorry, 2%. Let me choose a different style so it looks differently. There's my horizontal 10 meter offset. And if I did everything right, I should see a second profile lower than my first one. There it is. That's my design profile I started with. That is the secondary offset profile and it's dynamic. So if I were to change that 10 meter offset in plan to five meters, what happened? Because it's only five meters, this offset profile will come up here. So it's a dynamic profile offset as well as a higher horizontal offset. Uh, very nice for super elevation. All right, so not too much about profiles, but since we're talking about offset alignments, I wanted to show you that sort of newish offset profile tool as well. Show the bus bay, show the parking lane. So what do we do today? We talked about creation techniques. We talked about um, tangency. I showed you the solve PI option talked about the use of the parametric constraints. Then we moved into cul-de-sacs and, and why we should be using those parametric constraints instead of polylines. Same thing for reverse and compound curves. And then finally, the alignment and a little bit of profile offsets for bus bays and parking lanes, sorry, passing lanes. And that's pretty much at the end of my option. There's my email address. So feel free to, uh, to email me or just go to SODCAD support and email our support team. They can get you in touch with us if need be. What about our question situation? We do have a couple, a okay. couple good ones. So one comes in and we're asking, uh, can we convert an alignment back to a polyline once we're done using the alignment creation tool? So this yeah. is not creating from an object. This would be create using the creation tool and then looking to extract a polyline from it. I just offset it twice. So I'll just offset the alignment one direction, that's the polyline, and then offset that polyline back that same direction. And now I have a new polyline that's right on top of the alignment. There's, there's no tool that's built into the software that just converts an alignment to a polyline, except for the explode command, but you probably don't want to use that. <laughs> so offset it one direction, and then offset it right back, offset the, that polyline back, and now you have a polyline where your alignment is. That's great. And then All we've right. got another one coming in talking about uh, pond creation. How would we use an alignment for pond creation? How would I use an alignment for pond creation? Well, 
it's my opinion because just of the nature of pawns they almost always are more suited to grading objects and feature lines than pawns sorry than uh, than alignments but not to say that you can't use an alignment because i'm assuming that whoever asked the question is ultimately wanting to create um maybe a corridor with a pond or maybe that pond has a, a spillway on one side and in which case you know sometimes the alignment and profile is, is a better tool so it's a tough question to ask or sorry tough question to answer without a few more details so what i'm going to do real quick how much time we got uh in two minutes okay in two minutes i'm going to show you what i got uh before i do that are, are there any other ones that are maybe faster uh, there, is, there is one more with respect to uh criteria uh design criteria and yes. the paper lengths does the design criteria in native uh brought in with civil 3d have the ability to set transit or taper lengths oh for like a passing lane exactly because that would be based on speed and <clears throat> that would be based on speed and uh offset true uh, i don't know the answer to that question i have a feeling that it it's not part of the design criteria because the design criteria is typically for the center line um but i've never been asked the question i've never looked into it so um i don't have an answer to that one right now okay no worries okay. all right we can follow up afterwards with more detail if necessary okay so for the next two minutes i'll just talk quickly about the pond um as i said i would typically use feature lines and grading tools to do ponds um, but sometimes i know that especially if the pond isn't one elevation all the way around sometimes it's easier to create the the elevation part as a profile um, in fact what i'm going to do is I'll, I'll i'll demonstrate it as if it was a berm as opposed to a pond so let's do this so i'm gonna call this berm there we go. Labels don't care about. Don't need curves. Berm, 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 berm. All right. There's my berm center line. And so with berms, the pro if this is the existing ground, this is profile by the way. A berm will often go up like this. It'll start at the ground, it'll go flat like this, and it'll come back. That's often what berms look like. Sometimes you need a spillway in the middle of a berm. And so if it's if it's sort of proving difficult if you like to use feature lines instead of alignments sometimes creating the profile is awkward with a feature line so sometimes I'd I'd rather use alignment and profile to create the verticality of it I'll still use the feature line to create grading but I'll begin with the alignment so in, in our case here let me just quickly create a surface profile All right, let's move this to the back. So far we have an alignment. I'm gonna make a berm profile. And I'm not gonna be too careful with it, just cause uh, for the lack of time. All right, I will start the berm exactly on the end point. I'll go up to represent the top of my berm. I'll go flat also to represent the top of my berm. And I'll finish at the end. So there's my berm profile. And for me, if I'm doing a berm, I actually like doing alignments and profiles because I need to put that spillway here. It's way easier for me to do that using these tools than it is using the feature line tools. But I still need a feature line to do grading. But I just have an alignment and profile now. So to get the feature line, I use, where is it? this right there if your alignment has a profile I can generate a feature line from both of those objects if I select my alignment there's my feature line site there's the profile that I'm going to use there's the style create dynamic link to the alignment so now I don't want to do any weeding I now have something called an auto feature line that is dynamically linked with that alignment and that profile. Any change I make to either of those things, the feature line will update itself. And if I have grading 
emanating from that feature line, the grading will edit itself. So uh, that's how I like to use alignments for grading. So for a pond, depends on your situation, but that's uh, that's how I like to work. All right. It we did not want that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it's a tough one, right? Uh, yeah. Any other quick any other quick ones we can get to before Saeed finishes up? Uh, I just had one more regarding um, <clears throat> extracting a 3D polyline with change, but I think that's, I think you just answered that with respect to creating a feature line from alignment. Oh, and okay. that's going awesome. to, it's going to have kind of the, the civil 3D version of a 3D polyline and it will have chainage associated with it. That's true. Unless the, the question asker is requesting three-dimensional change because i've been asked that question too All right so imagine imagine this if i measured it was th exactly 300 meters uh to the station the 3d polyline or the feature line of course is going to be longer right because it's a, it's a 3d string and so if they're asking about three-dimensional change then no there's there's nothing out of the box that can do that but um if they're looking for change plus a 3d polyline i'm not a big fan of 3d polylines because Feature lines are better, in my opinion. So I would use a, a feature line instead. And so if that's what they're asking, then I think you're right, Colin. I think we've answered that question. But if they're talking about three-dimensional change, there's nothing out of the box that I can think of. Okay. And they were talking about three-dimensional change, so that uh, they clarified. Okay, okay good. Um, yeah. I think we'll let uh, maybe let Saeed wrap up. And if other people have questions that they need to continue with, uh, we'll still keep taking questions. Yeah, we can stick around after 1.30 uh, to continue answering some more questions if you want. But for now, thank you very much. I appreciate um, the 67 people that are still there. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch back to Saeed, and he's going to finish up. Thank you, Matt. Uh, just uh, for those who miss it at the beginning, uh, I would like to emphasize a little bit about the bundles. These are difficult times. A lot of people working from home, setting uh, remote environments. So these bundles will help you. If you need to set up a centric platform to collaborate with your team or or in one place, so BIM260 is the answer. You can reach out. We can have a demo for you really quickly. Also, I'll remind you about Bluebeam. Bluebeam, it's, it's a tool. When you have uh, remote meetings, you have to mark up drawings. There's no more desks. Nobody can can sit down in a desk this time. So uh, Bluebeam provides a remote desk where you can mark up at the same time with your consultants, your employees, anybody. And also uh, our accelerator to Beam. So anything templates, you want to kickstart your civil 3D, your workflow, your setup, just reach out. There's a lot of things we can do for you. And also quick reminder about our next events. Please uh, go to our website, our event section. Uh, there's a registration link, more description about the content, please register, there's a lot of people in and we have limits, so please uh, continue registering. And also I'd like to remind everyone about our solid assess. Sometimes you have issues with your deployment or with uh, any out of the products. So we have a team of experts. They're squally focused on keeping you up and running. So please reach out, this is complimentary to our customers. And uh, as Matt said, if you have any questions, we have a little bit of time right now, and also you can reach out to us. There is our emails and direct numbers to make it easy for everybody to connect with us. So please, if you have any questions, calling, I'll let you take the, the question links. Thanks, Said. Uh, just to finish off, Matt here again. We are recording this session, assuming everything goes well. We're going to be posting it someplace. And where that is, I'm not entirely sure right now. It could be our YouTube channel. It could be a link to the GoToWebinar. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for an email, possibly, that comes up, or even our website. That's great. Thank you. We do have uh, one more question. And I think it is the last one, apart from compliments on your presentation. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Uh, asking about a passing lane. So if we maybe if we could share the screen back to you, Matt, and just take a quick look at instead of just a widening, doing a full passing lane. Is that the one from um, Caitlin? Caitlin, yeah, I think I actually just answered that one via the text. Oh, apologies, um, yeah, I see. No, it here no now. problem, no problem. <laughs> and so the question was, 
I think how to add a passing lane on an existing road, yes? Yes. So I've never tried. My my guess is to create an alignment along the existing edge of pavement and then create uh, an offset, alignment offset from that and then use the widening parameters from that. that that's where I would start. The, the fact that I've never tried it before, maybe I'd have to do some experimentation, but that's where I would start. You know, take that polyline that you already have on the edge of pavement, make that an alignment, and then create an offset and widening from that. That's where I would start. Okay, thanks, Matt. Apologies for the misunderstanding. Oh, no problem. Uh, you weren't expecting me to go in there and answer some questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> <My bad. laughs> well, fellas, uh, thank you very much uh, for your your technical expertise and and to answer all these questions. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope to meet you again next week for our session about corridors. It's going to be fantastic, so please don't miss it. Uh, I wish you all have a wonderful week, and please stay safe.